Hey, welcome to CodeJug, everybody. My name is Chris Judd. I'm the leader of CodeJug. And uh, before we introduce Darren, I do have a special announcement. CodeJug now has a YouTube channel, so I'll send out an email. All the past four meetings are now already up there, so you can go watch and share them with your family and friends. We made great Christmas gifts. <laughs> um, Tonight, we're lucky to have Darren Myers from uh, Endor AI to talk about the dark side of open source. So I will hand it over to Darren. Thank you very much. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm an annoying solution architect for Endor Labs, and uh, my, my background is kind of an odd one for a solution architect type person. Uh, I actually, my last role was I ran the AppSec team for CrowdStrike. Right, so they have that kind of practitioner background, and I was a, a software security researcher for Veracode before that. And then for the 10 ish years before that, I did a mix of like software engineering and building AppSec programs for the building AppSec program at Target. I helped uh, launch the AppSec as a practice at US Bank. So, okay, um, started my career in wiring closets, running low voltage cabling to the servers all over the place, too. So, I've done a little bit of everything, but I've been focused on AppSec for about the past 18 years. Uh, and mostly from the practitioner and research side. So it's a little bit, little bit unusual background for uh, solutions architects, but there it is. I'm curious, I mean, obviously y'all are Java developers or Java developer adjacent, being that this is a jug, but uh, just kind of curiosity, like, are, like is this a, are you, are you a group of people that's like, you know, yay, Java is like, yeah, Java is what I do, or, <laughs> or I mean, it kind of goes all over the place, I'm just curious. Yeah, I have been doing Java since 1.0. Nice. Yeah. Can you explain, uh, explain uh, AppSec? I, I think I know, but I don't know now. Yeah, so I mean, you, you get a little bit of uh, Ask 10 AppSec people, you'll get you know, 15 answers on okay. that a little bit, but essentially it's the practice of information security as it relates to software development. Historically, it's been kind of everything before the boom, right? So all the practices before you actually ship, I mean, that was you know AppSec. So look for vulnerabilities in code, look for yeah, secure design work, things like that. It's a bit different than DevOps account. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of heading that way, right? So okay. Dev, DevSecOps is kind of a way to do the AppSec practice with that same shared responsibility model that gave birth to DevOps. Okay. The idea that you know AppSec was and still is in a lot of cases kind of this team off to the side. I see. Right, just doing work and telling you what your baby's ugly, right? Okay. Um, and security has kind of a bad reputation in a lot of ways, right? We, really? we tend to have this reputation of like, you know, hey, you just walked up to a guy and punched him in the face and says, hey, you know, you're vulnerable to getting punched in the face vulnerability. You should really do something about that. And I just walk away, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I try not to do that because <laughs> I've been on the other end of that punch. Um, so kind of modern AppSec is a little bit more about trying to be a partner with development teams and say, look, we're all on the same side. Our job is to ship software, right? And if we're part of the emerging things, product security, which yeah. includes kind of traditional app stack. And it's a, it's a lot of like, hey, we're all on the same side. We're trying to ship product, okay. right? You need to ship quality product. You hire SREs to make sure you have site reliability for your product. You know, you hire performance engineering to make sure you have performance engineering quality for your product. You hire... Uh, you know, the interaction designers to make sure that you have a quality user experience. You hire security people to make sure that it's not going to, you know, treat data unsafely or expose you to a breach, right? So that's kind of the emerging model. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of places that there's a security team somewhere out there running tools and telling you your baby's ugly and then leading up to you to fix it. Yeah. But part of why we exist, by the way, for trying to fix that. All right. So I, I derailed you. You yeah. own Java. I, I do know Java. Java is not, uh, it, it has been a little while since I was a Java developer. It's been probably 10 years since I did it every day. Um, I kind of moved on to Python and Go mostly. Oh, Python. Yeah, okay. well, <laughs> one goes where the work is, right? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, the the rise of open source, I've been an open source adopter. So, I mean, it's, I started using Linux in 96, I want to say, right? And, and kind of became an open source person, right? And, and saw this is a good model for it. And, Back then, it was very much like you, know, you do, you tell somebody you want to use open source stuff, and they were like, yeah, I don't know about that, right? That's a lot of legal risk. That's a lot of, how do I know it's quality software? I want to buy, I want to buy stuff, right? I want to, or I want to write it in house. That's definitely changed, right? And I, I'm willing to bet, you know, kind of kind of looking at the, the ages across the room here, most of you guys seem like you've been in the industry for a while, right? Yeah. Uh, good, me too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, have you noticed the change? Like, have you noticed the change in, in open source perception? 
Do you agree with it? Oops. <laughs> you know, <laughs> developers who can standardize on like Spring Framework and those kinds of things, you've got common code base kinds of things that you're familiar with that you can pretty much shift to other projects without a lot of effort and a lot of, without a lot of learning curve. Okay. It's become a standard, yeah. right? It's become a good thing. And it's, it's become so much of a standard, in fact, that like it's now most of the code you ship. In most projects across most of our customers, it hovers right around 80%. Um, I bet this has grown, actually, since, since we did this research. Um, but it's, why would I write something that somebody else has already written who's probably a domain expert in that? Right? I don't want to write an off, you know, another off method. I don't want to write another website control. I don't want to write another, you know, JDBC marshaller. Like, I don't want to do that work. I want to work on the interesting things that are unique to my organization, and I want my organization to go fast. Right? I've been a software manager briefly, and like the shit. Right? Now we got to get out the door. So having this huge library of stuff, like I get to inherit the productivity of all of my fellow programmers solving problems and sharing information, and the good test coverage. <laughs> Generally, generally, not always, but yeah, I agree with you, right? Like choose. You, you, you often have options of things that are extremely well tested. Many eyes have been on them. They tend to be high quality. They're often backed by, you know, well-known organizations, trust organizations. You know, Google has their open source libraries. Microsoft has their open source libraries, which in 96, I didn't think I'd ever say that sentence, but you know, they, they've turned around quite a bit too and, and become kind of embraced it. And, even so far as, you know, as buying GitHub, because this is the world now, right? So I'd like to kind of say, like, most of the software that you're shipping isn't written as much as it's assembled, right? Your job becomes working on harder and harder problems that involve going, okay, there's easy parts and hard parts, easy parts I'm just going to borrow and stitch together, and I'm going to work on hard parts. Think of all the advancement that we've gotten in, in software over the past 10 years because of that, right? The catch with it is that you inherit the risk, too. Right? Nothing's risk free. I mean, my software's bug free, right? Everyone else is crap, though. Not nine, nine, right? <laughs> right. Does every problem? Nine. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, all, we all know, right? We write bugs. Open source developers, no different. We write bugs, right? I was just out of curiosity how many of you contributed to an open source project? Oh, okay. So, like, you know, it's. It's a passion project in a lot of cases, right? Some people are lucky enough to, you know, be paid for that, but most of the time it's something you do off on the side because you want to solve this problem, right? Um, or you're fixing it. Like, I love this thing except for this part that I hate. I'm going to fix it. Bust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, like, it does in some ways tend to lead to high quality, but also, like, you're probably not having a full software stack. And then there are some projects that are like really, really careful about that have good CI practices, really good coverage, have quality people look at it. Like there are a few of those. But there's a really long tail of things where it's just somebody's pet project. And like I don't care how good of a developer you are, you're gonna make mistakes. Right. And in theory, many eyes, all bugs are shallow. But then there's things like log for shell, right? Where or the open SSL vulnerabilities that happen, you know, seemingly every couple of years now. Right, where it's hugely widely used. Somebody should have seen this, but people aren't really looking at the code they're adopting. I mean, early days, you kind of read through it and kind of get a sense of it and then adopt it. But now, you know, made it installed, man. Like, <laughs> get out of my life, right? Um, or Bazel, if, you're, if you guys are Bazel users. And like, that's it's great in so many ways. But the flip side of it is, of course, you, you are inheriting a lot of risk, right? And it's not just security risk, it's also stuff like, okay, what happens when this gets abandoned? Now what? It's going to work for a while, but BitRod is real. And then what happens if there is a, a bad bug that I uncover a bump up against, or there, heaven forbid, a security flaw, and like there's another log for shell and something that's not maintained. And now I've got to go figure out how to replace this library, you know, all of my code because nobody's going to patch it. Or maybe there'll be a monkey patch out there, and you pull on AWS or they're like, we patched log for shell. And then they actually made it worse. <laughs> we didn't find out for three months. So we have to do it all again. Right. So how do you get out in front of that? What do you got to worry about? And, you know, how do you how do you balance that whole like there's there's the legal risk. There's the you know kind of quality and, and tech ops type risk. There's the security risks that come along for the ride. How do you make sure that you keep tabs on that without going the whole like flood route of, oh, my God, we can't possibly do this because it's all scary. It's not right. It has flaws like anything else. It's just you don't have a throat to choke. <clears throat> 
there's a problem and it's on you to figure out how to fix it. You can't guarantee that the open source organization that's behind this thing is even going to fix the flaw that you find. Right? So we, we thought this was going to be the world, right? This beautiful solar punk utopia of open source software. Everything's going to run smoothly because everything will be open and nobody can hide back code. You've never found back code in open source, have you? It's all very high quality. <laughs> We, I mean, we know better, right? Like it, it, it's code. It's there's there's any decent sized project. Like you mentioned, Spring. If you haven't sworn at Spring in the past month, I don't believe that you're a Spring user, right? There's there's all kinds of little like why in there, and it's got to be backwards compatible bugs because otherwise no one will ever operate, right? So what we ended up with was dependency hell, right? Like that's what we got. Like if I told you tomorrow like, I need you to do a major version upgrade to to Spring Web. How fast do I need to run from you, <laughs> right? Because like you're not going to do that overnight. Oh, it's, it, and this is one of the things I constantly hit on AppSec people about is like, you know, say, well, it's just just you know, update your stuff. Okay, that's great if you're uploading, you know, updating like you know, maybe a patch level, right? But minor versions don't break anything, right? Of course they do, right? And this is the thing is like, you know how long I spent last? You know, this is Go, but like same thing, right? I spent last week, I spent two solid days trying to get one Go library upgraded in my company's Monterey Bow. Right. And like, I, I ended up giving up because, like, <laughs> I don't know the code well enough. And I was just like, yes, I was going to help, but I, I can't figure this out because of the interdependencies, because of the relationships, because of circular relationships, because of all these things that come from the right with any dependency. That's not an open source problem. The, what makes it an open source problem is that anybody can write a library now. Like, how many, how many JVC queues are there? <clears throat> I, I was curious because there's one called C3PO that I like to use for demos because it's on brand, right? And I was like, I wonder how many actual options are on. There's 112 that I found in just like a cursory search on data, right? For key managers um, or for connection pool managers, I'm sorry. So like, they, that's, that's too many, right? And then, you know, everyone in your organization is of course standardized on one library for everything, right? <laughs> Maybe if you're in a term person company, right? So, like, how do you how do you guys manage that stuff? Like, dependency hell is real. What do you do? I'm curious. We have pitch log in the concourse pipeline. They early detect the so as long as you don't have a particular type, they automatically they will flag and then the other one allows us to move it even test and run it. Okay. Like, cut, cut there, so. So, you're, so you're kind of gating on like vulnerabilities, but what about like do you do any kind of standardization or what stops someone from just you know using some random crap that nobody's reviewed? Anything? Big enterprises have lockdown on like Nexus or mm -hmm. you know it's it's gate they, they do gatekeeping at that level mm -hmm. to prevent you from pulling in something exotic that doesn't fit with the organization. And, and then you have the whole architecture team whose job it is to manage that. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. Like that is used often to keep people from pulling in totally yes. random stuff. And we cannot I've never seen anything where it'd be like, oh yeah, you know, maybe you should be on a version of something that was published in the last 12 years. That <laughs> right. seems uh, a lot less common. <laughs> At least I want to say it doesn't. And they use it to like lock out vulnerable versions of like lock for shell kinds of things. Great, like a trusted repo register. But you know, local in, in those organizations, local developers can do anything until they get ready to push it to CI and then they're stuck because it's only from what can come through Nexus or right. Artifactory. Have you ever guys, any of you ever worked in an environment that was controlled like that? I have been. We have that. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> right? It's challenging. You got to appeal to the architectural review board and I want to use this to, thing three weeks later. <laughs> right? And like how we do you even know how they were reviewing? I mean maybe they were transparent with you. But my experience with it is like the architectural review board or the equivalent thereof. And three weeks later you get a no and you'd be like, why? You'd be like, no. Yeah. Well, okay. Black hole. We don't yeah. do that here. Yeah. We know uh, it's just not we'd rather use this thing. Okay, cool. But I now have to learn a whole new framework, right? As a corollary, you ask for it and you say yes because we're doing that. Yeah, just rubber stamp. Yeah. <laughs> also, we have the Maven build, uh, we have internal repository, mm -hmm. uh, artifactory. So you cannot directly get from the internet, you cannot download yeah. 
So when you proxy everything, that's the only one that works. Yeah. When you try to make an allow list, but then you have those other problems, right? You're introducing new risks to your organization to try to solve this risk. And like, you still have this problem, right? You still have dependency health. Yeah. It's just very carefully managed dependency health. And it depends. So <laughs> most, approved dependency health. what most teams do is they fall behind. Yes, exactly. Right? And it wasn't the whole promise of open source if you go faster. Right? Because there's all this pre-written stuff I could just use rather than re reinventing the wheel. How many people do you think just copy paste stuff to get around it? I remind you, I was on a security team. <laughs> yeah, copy paste, yeah, dependencies and that sort of thing. Yeah, and once you get it working, you probably don't upgrade it very often. Of course not. And plus, that's, that's for the next project. Yep. Which will never happen. Right. So go to the open source library and pretend you wrote it. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that. Or vendor it in. <laughs> right. Let's vendor it in. So you, you'll you'll take like you'll grab the jar and just put it in. You'll just check it in as a file object. Or you'll actually grab the source code and build it, and it'll just be in a library directory in, yeah, in your repo. Work around bugs that way. See, yeah. that stuff will be caught by like a Nexus scanner. But if yeah. you copy paste the code, I mean, people try. I mean, I like kind of made their name doing snippet detection like that, but but only yeah, an, yeah it's probably hard. an actual right. security tester. Right, and that's the great thing is like you've incentivized people to do that by trying to get out in front of this and put controls around it. And like, I built plenty of like done supporting programs. If you give developers a game to play, they will play it really, really well, yeah. right? <laughs> and it, it's a thing that I had, I've had to explain to like programming management over and over and over again, right? Like if you create an incentive for someone to do something, we will do it. My favorite story, a little, little digression here, but my favorite story about that is I worked with this guy you know, big white beard kind of developer, right? Somebody who's been in comp sign when, when computers still build rooms, right? And uh, <laughs> his team, his manager had decided that he was going to score people's productivity on number of lines of code committed. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> so there were two responses. One, one of the more junior guys was like, well, I'm going to vendor everything in then because then my commits will be huge. This is back in SVN days. So like linear commit history, right? And like that he gave the system that way. This guy was unfireable. So he decided to make it a point to go three months and have his net code commits be negative. He did all the refactoring work that he'd wanted to do for years <laughs> and just made sure there was every commit of his averaged out to negative <laughs> over months ago. <laughs> but that's the thing is like, you know, you, you give people things, they will find a game to play. Yep. Right. So the problem doesn't go away, right? You still have the risk to manage. And part of the reason that you have the risk to manage is because you don't just get what you asked for, right? You have this dependency iceberg, right? Yeah. So you ask for Spring. What comes along with Spring? Is it all code written by, you know, well, who's, you know who's Spring? What does what features are you wanting to use? Right, exactly. With Spring, you like. <laughs> well, then, and then all the transit dependencies, right? So it, it's a software package. It also has open source packages it depends on, and they have open source packages they depend on. And my record in scanning open source code like this is 57 levels deep, Ooh. right? That's how big dependency graphs can can easily get, especially that was JavaScript. So I put it on the list of reasons why JavaScript is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, it, it's a real problem because even if I do my research for up here at the tip of the iceberg and the stuff I asked for, what about all this stuff, right? Did I get something? Did they make a mistake? Did they make a bad choice? Have they upgraded back in the last 24 months, 36 months, right? Do I have things like, okay, and like when you try to get out ahead of these problems, you choose things like, okay, so this hasn't had any commits in the past 12 months. Is it bad software? I mean, if I'm a betting man, probably, that bit rot's real, but also I've seen things that haven't had updates in the past 12 months because they're very small, they're very targeted, and they're very high quality. Why update? How can I tell the difference? I'll go read the source code every time, and then I'm losing my productivity advantage, right? So how do I get out in front of this stuff? And how do I think about like open source package selection, basically? If I'm going to pick open source, how do I get out in front of this idea of I'm also picking risk, right? So vulnerabilities are the things that I'm a security guy, right? So that's the first thing that pops into a lot of people's heads, vulnerabilities, right? How do I pick something that's not going to lead to me getting breached, right? And it's like, this This is the thing. It's like 95% of the problems are down here, right? There's, it's not a vulnerability in Spring Web. You've probably patched that out, probably got alert. If you're using something like Nexus, it's probably told you you need to update. Might have even done it automatically, depending on how you got it configured, right? It just goes away in the next build after everything breaks. And, you know, but what about the stuff it inherited? How do I get those things, right? 
And then you have the, especially things like Java, where, you know, JavaScript, you have less of this problem a little bit because JavaScript has this history of like every library does this one tiny little thing, which leads to different problems. But like, if this, this one left pads things, and <laughs> you know, it was zero. So I don't know if you guys remember that thing that the news. Someone broke left pad and the whole internet broke. It was great. Okay. Um, but like that's the thing. But Java doesn't have that history, right? It wasn't built to you know deploy stuff to the browser. We don't talk about applets. Um, that's dead. <laughs> but that never happened. Uh, but like it wasn't it wasn't built from the ground up to deploy stuff to browsers. So it tends to be big monolith libraries, right? It tends to be things like Apache Commons. Everything you could possibly want to do if you're in a library, right? How much of that are you actually using? Fifteen percent, maybe, right? In a given application. Right? But you're still importing the whole thing. So if I come as a security guy and I go, hey, you know, you got Apache Commons text and it's got this vulnerability, you're like, yeah, but I'm not even using that feature. Are you happy with me as a security person that I pointed this out to you? No, I just cost you a bunch of research work and I probably interrupted you to do it because it's critical. Right? Or like you said, you know, Nexus is blocking it, right? Now I can't do any of my work because Nexus blocks common text, even though none of us are using the part of it that's vulnerable. Right? So how do you get in front of that? You go back and forth and argue with your security team or automate it. Right? We're developers. If you have an ASD, go find out if you're actually using those functions. Right? Is, is, am I using that part? Like, I know what function it's in. Pretty well documented. At least narrow it down. Why not find out, like, if it actually affects me? Let the computer do the work. Right? So is everything a vulnerability? Oh, right. It's very easy to focus on vulnerabilities and you know, how do we get out in front of them. But like, what about like stuff like Gorilla, right? The Gorilla toward the end of 20, I think it was the end of 2021, they announced it or mid 2022. I can't remember the actual announcement was, but they were just like, yeah, we're abandoning this. It was like the number one HTTP service toolkit for Go. Hugely popular. Now everyone's going to find a new thing. <laughs> right? It's a risk. You're, you're, you're committing to an ecosystem. You're not just picking a library, right? You, you, if you've ever tried to swap something out, my favorite is to swap out an ORM, right? You ever tried to swap out an ORM? Yes. Did you have fun? No. <laughs> right? It, it, you're committing to an ecosystem. You're committing to an approach. You're committing to a way of thinking about the problem that you're solving. That's why you chose a thing in the first place. If it becomes a problem, you're never going to get updates again. Right? And it's very easy to fall into the trap. Like, well, okay, but it's working. I don't need to update it. It's fine. Is that ever going to bite you? Absolutely. Right? Yes. It's working on Java 17. <laughs> Is it going to work on Java 23? Who knows? We'll see. Right? So what do you, what do, you do with something like this on Zarkai? What do people end up doing? Yeah, I'm sure you guys have been part of this. What do you do? Something goes into maintenance mode. Sure. <laughs> Swap it out, right? So that's yeah. one option. No, you hide it. Hide it in the closet. Yeah. yeah. You keep it there. Yep. Yeah. Just brush fingers hope for the best. Yeah. yeah. People people fork it, right? I'm gonna bring the source in, I'm gonna compile it myself. And you know, at some point it's gonna break and I'm gonna I'm just gonna take over maintenance, gonna maintain my own fork of it. Sometimes we give it back to the community. Sometimes we do not. Right. And you know, I only got a couple of hands. But anybody ever run an open source project? Did, did you feel appreciated? <laughs> right? It's it's a lot to take on, right? So it's a huge problem. Like, how do I find out about these things? And like the best that you can really do is you know have somebody who's monitoring the projects that you're that are important to your organization go like, am I starting to see leading indicators that something good might happen? And with Gorilla, who no, right? Am I been surprised? Am I just you know, one guy maintains it and he's like, I'm going home, right? I'm done with this nonsense, I'm out of here. There's nothing you can do about that. But there's also things where you see like, oh, hey, you know, the commit activity slowing down. Fewer and fewer committers. Maybe I should start thinking about replacing this before it becomes an issue, right? See, you're not gonna save yourself work, but you are gonna save yourself some payments, right? So, and like, this was super popular, 18,000 stars on GitHub. Only thing that matters, GitHub stars, right? Yeah, we, we know better, right? Popularity has a lot more to do. Like, that's great. Lots of people like it. Lots of people are using it. No guarantee of support. Right? So it's a risk you accept. 
right? You have to have a plan for it. PyTorch was kind of a different thing. Not a vulnerability, not exactly, right? Nobody made a mistake in terms of vulnerability. It wasn't abandoned, wasn't, you know, archived, renamed, any of that stuff. Um, some jackass just compromised it. And, <laughs> and it was only for five days, right? But if you compiled PyTorch into a Python application at that point, and nobody uses that, right? You know, there's machine learning that's not very popular right now at all, right? Not, not, a, not a real worry. But seriously, like, 87,000 repos had some version of this and were probably affected. You know, and a lot of other open source things are, you know, especially in the machine learning language, a lot of people are, night, you know, nightly or more doing rebuilds, right? Where we live in a continuous integration world. Right? I'm just, just curious, like, I'm assuming you guys are all on CI pipelines at this point. Anybody still a holdout? No nightly build servers anymore? Okay. Every time I do a talk like this, I have to ask because there's, there has been one until like the past three years. And I haven't gotten any hands since about three years ago. For what, not having a pipeline? Yeah, for yeah. We, we still just have a nightly build. Uh, we don't even have a nightly build. We just build releases. Nice. <clears throat> That's some software? It's way back. It's a uh, <clears throat> uh, wide range. Yeah, all the way like it's all the way from web apps down to mine's just like a batch loading program. Nice. You don't hear that very often anymore. I mean, they're they're working toward having pipelines, but yeah, it's just fair enough. That's, <laughs> that's slow to adopt things. Fair enough. Yeah. Usually, the places where I'm hearing the the people who are a little more slow to adopt it are like embedded systems, places where patching is expensive. Right. Web was first to do it because you know I can I can ship five times a day and nobody cares. Right. Uh, automotive. They're they're not modern. I mean Tesla and Rivian and like that are, but like old old traditional automotive, mostly not on modern pipelines because their software quality process is insane. Because it's really only been recently that they get high adoption for people doing software updates. Like, do you want to have people drive into a shop and have an software update them? Right. And so there's there's like we don't we don't do this daily thing. It's not worth it. But it's changing, right? And so you have a ton of people. The the vast majority of users of this probably ship something compromised, right? It's just because one jackass decided to compromise it. And like, that's that's one of the risks you take on is like, where is the quality control for open source, right? It's it's distributed, right? It's very easy to sneak in a vulnerability like this, you know, sneak in a compromise over the course of multiple commits. Right? I do like six different PRs over the course of six months and they finally come together. like. You review PRs. Do you take the time to understand every single line change in a PR? I sure as hell don't. Who's got time for that? And that's before you get the 17,000 line unreviewable PR, right? No, no one does that. <laughs> right? So, like, how, how do you get out in front of that? Like, how do you detect something like that has happened? How do you respond to it? Well, you got to have a plan. You can't just, you know, the first time it happens, you know, we'll figure it out. You gotta know, like, if something like this happens, what are we gonna do? What's our response? Can we roll back? Can we redeploy? Can we, like, what? What's our response plan? Here? Right? Because I mean, this, this can happen with traditional software too. Like, this isn't this isn't an open source only problem. This is open source makes it scale. Right? There are absolutely pre massive open source adoption. There were absolutely cases of people getting a job at the company in order to introduce something malicious. That's harder. I can do this from China. Very hard for me to sit in China and get a job at, you know, be retired. That's changing too, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But, right, <clears throat> with open source software, I can be anywhere in the world, right? And uh, are you, with something like Spring, how many PRs does that they get every day? And it's like, how many different people are reviewing them? What's the chance that one person goes, well, that's a little weird, but I'm going to approve the PR, and, another, and they see another thing, go, wait a minute, I'm not going to make that connection. You have 15 people, you might catch it, right? Because maybe the same three people are reviewing PRs because those are the only three people who ever review PRs, right? Yeah, we all love to just spend time in PR review. Favorite. So, I mean, that's a, a lot of the open source risk stuff is not like, you know, fear, uncertainty. That was just, that's what can happen. And you got to have a plan, right? You got to pin your versions. <laughs> you do. And you got to maybe not do any releases during. When people are on vacation, <laughs> yeah. at the end of the year. <laughs> Please stop releasing on Fridays. 
And it's partly because, I mean, I don't think anyone in this room is surprised by the complexity of open source software, you know, being developers. I, I've given this talk to a lot of security people, as you can tell. But I mean, it, it's it's changing, right? It's it's more complicated. It's not as simple. You know this, right? It's not as simple as grabbing a library and going, oh, I get code. Right? You are inheriting all of the warts. You're inheriting all of the warts and decisions that those people make, right? Not, not just my bad design decisions, but my decision to use that open source library, you're also getting like, if that was a bad decision, too bad, you guys got screwed, right? I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Like, I haven't, I haven't been a software engineer full time for well over a decade, right? I still publish open source software though, right? People still use it. Like, are you, how much do you trust me? How much do you trust my GitHub account? My GitHub account doesn't get hacked. I mean, for me, yeah, I'm a security guy, right? I got two factor and all that going on, but like, it still happens. GitHub's been hacked before, right? What about the operational? Like, we, we talk about security risk all the time. Oh, there's vulnerabilities. Oh, there's you know typo squatting. Oh, there's okay, yeah. What about just like this is outdated? You pinned your version. Congratulations, your version is now 95 releases behind, and hasn't been updated in three years. Also, there's a new CD in it. Good luck coming all the way out there tonight. Right? No one's sleeping. <laughs> uh, that was a lot of the thing with Log for Shell, right? Is that like people were running on Log for Shell and they're finding these old like 1.x versions of Log for Shell. Like, oh, we're not affected by Log for Shell. We don't do anything. Like, why? Why are you? There's like nine vulnerabilities in that. Why? But now, now you have to update. And they had to come up to a 2.x because there was no safe version of one. And they totally broke it. Yeah. You can't use it anymore. No. Right, like it, it's it's a situation where like and people are moving away from it, or they're or they're going to wrappers and things to try to avoid this because, like, it's not the first time there's been problems with Log4j where the and and where there have been solutions that are not great, right, or that you know break things, right? How like minor version update should be safe, right? You gamble? <laughs> I'm not a gambling man. I, I've had I've been bitten by that too many times. Right, Kubernetes looking at you, uh, <laughs> notorious, right? So like we, we talk about the, the security stuff all the time, but there's operational risk too, and, it, and it's not it's not a bad trade off, right? I, I don't want to I don't want to come off as like poo pooing open source. I love open source, right? I, I get to do all kinds of cool stuff that I would never ever do. Like I'm an Arduino fan as a hobby. I make LED art with Arduinos. And like you know, open Wi-Fi stacks that track people walking in space, and I don't I can't do that math, right? I don't have the math for that stuff. Somebody's done it for me. I have access. I have access to all this stuff, right? I love it, but you have to have a plan for the risks, and you can't let your security team take over and say well, the only thing that matters is security because you know better, right? Risk is risk, but there are emerging attack vectors, right? There's 650 percent. I don't. I don't necessarily trust that number, but it's a lot, right? We're seeing lots more people actually targeting your supply chain, right? This is stuff that manufacturing, like critical manufacturing has dealt with for years and years and years, decades, right? That like, if, if you're the military, for example, and you're gonna buy bullets, you need to know the history of everything that's going into that bullet so that you know that thing's gonna fire when you want it to fire, it's not gonna blow up in the valley or be sabotaged or whatever. The more complex the thing you're ordering, the more sure you have to be of your supply chain. Software kind of needs to catch up to that as an industry. Like, if you're dealing with DOD, you probably have had this argument already. But if you're not, like, finally the federal government is getting around to it and going, you got to have a software bill of materials. We got to know where your stuff comes from. Right? There's more to supply chain than like solar winds. Right? That wasn't an open source library. Right? But it was still a supply chain problem because of the tool I used to generate the things, generate the thing, right? Like, my tooling was compromised. And now I'm suddenly. Compiling backdoors into everything I have, right? What what if you know Java C gets com compromised? You know, and you know which Java C they're using. I can think of five that are in production in most places, right? I'm sure there's a long tail of other ones that people have their own little lovely little custom patches. Do you trust it? You got to know, right? You got to know, and people like the cybercrime and nation state attacker people are figuring out that this is a weak spot that people are not paying enough attention to and they are starting to go after it we are starting to see it it's still not the biggest threat you have in your whole life yet but it's definitely headed in that direction right so we got to get out in front of it what does that look like 
So supply chain is like so supply chain attacks are not accidents, right? So so we're putting aside things. Most vulnerabilities are just mistakes, right? I forgot to do a check. I made a bad assumption about how this would be used. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, I just made a mistake, and somebody can have used my my poor planning, my mistake, whatever, to do something I didn't intend, right? These are actual attacks. These are people doing something in the open source community that's deliberate and malicious, right? So there, there's there's about 10 of them actually, but these are the three ones that I would like everyone to kind of think about and have a plan for. So one is, hey, I'm just gonna build something and it's malicious. It sounds like it's really useful. I'm gonna name it something really cool so that I'll get a lot of Google search results and try to get it on the front of Hacker News. Have, you know, and these are like cyber criminals like that. That group of people, like these are well-funded people. They have marketing departments, believe it or not, right? This, this is a business for them. They're not playing around. So they can get something pretty high in the results and it does something useful, like validates credit cards. You know, you, need, you, want, to do, you want to do a high offline credit card validation because you don't want to do it online if it's malformed, right? Great opportunity to exfiltrate that. Why is your credit card validator making calls to a server in China? I mean, could be legit. Seems sketchy, right? Actually, why is it making calls to a server at all? It's supposed to be state validation. Right, so that kind of thing, right? How do you get out in front of something like this was deliberately put out there? It has some utility, but it was designed to be malicious. A very, very common version of this, and like the package repos, Maven Central and like that are getting better about spotting this, but there was crypto miners. There was a huge rash of that about three years ago, where like they're not after exfiltrating your data, they're after consuming your AWS bill, right? And turning it into Bitcoin, right? Not a vector most people are thinking about. They're like, I'm, they're going to compromise my application. No, they're just going to borrow your, your CPU cycles. And Amazon is unhappy. <laughs> All right. Name confusion. Similar idea, but I'm going to give you, instead of URL live, I'm going to give you UR live. Easy typo to make. Right? Now you have my malicious version of the package. Typo squatter. Right? Hey, I bet somebody's going to typo this. I'm going to register a package by that. It might even be a copy of the legit package for a while, and then I replace it out with something malicious. Right? And the other one is to just, you know, like we do it with PyTorch, right? Subvert a legitimate package. I'm going to damage the, the real package in some way, replace it with my code, either by like compromising the whole human factors thing to get it checked in, right? Get it accepted to the PR, or by compromising my Maven Central account, right? I'm just going to upload a, a new binary, that's a new jar, right? And like we're we're trying to get on of that, we're trying to get signing. But like if I compromise your, your repo by just tricking the people into accepting my PR, that's like it's kept signed. Right? Code signing doesn't solve the whole problem for you. Right. So how does this work? Right. Advertise a malicious package. Hey, howdy, I got a thing for you, right? Makes sense. Right? This is this is the old school scammer approach, right? This this is this is a scam as old as time. It's just been applied to software now. I'm going to trick you into using something I want you to use, right? This is also sometimes called a, a poison water and whole attack, right? Oh, I know you're going here all the time, so I'm going to give you a very attractive oasis to come drink water from, and it's poison. How does it happen? Yeah, all the time, right? So you'll you see them advertise as a backdoor. They're not usually a backdoor. They're usually just a malicious package that somebody tricked you into using. That's a front door, sorry, All right? They advertise it straight out. Name confusion, same kind of thing, right? URL lag. Right? This one actually happened, by the way. It was a, it was a Python application. URL lab 3 is a very, 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 very popular library. It does all kinds of URL and HTTP manipulation stuff. Except it's supposed to have two L's. Be honest with yourself, would you have noticed? Would you have noticed that typo, right? Would you would you notice something like that in a POM XML of all places? No, you did maybe install once it's in there forever. Good luck, right? Would you spot that in a PR? <laughs> right? You need you need tools for this. There's no way around this. And like credit where credits due, places like Maven Central and PyPI and and NPM, right? They they've done a lot of work on their end to try to catch these things. And they are now very short lived. These things are usually found and shut down in a few days. But again, most of you are using modern pipelines. I bet most of you are shipping software daily, multiple times a day. Right? I don't know. It's just right here. It's just 
quick, you know, show of hands. How many are doing actually multiple ships a day, multiple releases? No, nobody really. <laughs> I'm surprised. I usually at least get a couple. Um, roughly, not daily. I guess they're old school. Yeah, four times a month, probably. Really? Wow. I, that, that's that's honestly surprising to me. I, I usually get answers where people are are shipping either multiple times a week, daily, or sometimes multiple times a day. And then maybe not necessarily to production, right? But to some integration environment, some test environment. And guess what? We're in a remote work world. Oh yeah, every day. Okay. And multiple times every day. Yeah. Production, not. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Is you are. I mean, depending on where you guys work, this might be true, but like we live in a remote work world. How many of you have like staging and test environments that are technically exposed to the internet? Some controls, I'm sure, but. <laughs> right? It, it's increasingly common that like, okay, it's it's product, it's not production in that it's got some like authentication and some extra stuff around it, but it's kind of production-ish. Like it's out there. Right, and somebody could so could attack it and do things. Hopefully, it doesn't have any like customer data in it. So if it was breached, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. But it's a thing to worry about. Right, it's kind of your last spot for defense too. Right, if it makes it to staging, you better catch it there before you push it to production. I've heard that like Google assumes that their network is compromised, yep. and most of it is exposed to the internet anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that encourages. Strong security controls. Yep, they were one of the first to do it, um, and a lot of people have followed suit now. And it, it's kind of a philosophy. It, it's um, and again, it's a little bit of a digression, but like so many people, you you listen, you watch like security. Even now, you watch security people talk about how to defend networks. They'll use this castle metaphor. There's walls and walls and walls, and you put all your stuff in the middle. And it's like we abandoned that as a society a long time ago for a reason. Like New York doesn't have a series of walls. Right, we have different things. We have things are open, things are accessible. Most buildings are public. You can walk in at least the front lobby, right, without without getting tackled or challenged, right. And they just assume that the public has access to that. It might include bad actors. So there's also cameras. There's also you know police presence. There's also all these things that are designed to like, okay, if a bad actor exists and does a thing, we're going to catch them relatively quickly. Is the hope, and we'll accept a certain degree of bad stuff, right? But like. You're in Columbus, your crime rate's zero, right? <laughs> well, you accept a certain amount, right? It's part of living in a city. You, you can't get it to zero. What you'd have to do to get it to zero would be no one would want to live here, right? It'd be a police state. So like, it's like modern security is starting to kind of get that. And like, I, I think it kind of got forced a little bit with COVID, right? Because you had suddenly like, people were like, no, 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 we're going to have a lockdown network. So you can now, right? Your, your whole staff is working from home. You've got to open some stuff up. Your VPN hardware all went boom. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, did that happen to anybody where your VPN took a dive when when we like when everything shut down? No, I had so many friends I know work at companies where they're like, it'll be fine, and they were massively under provisioned, <laughs> right? And so what they do, they they open some stuff up to the internet, right? They open email up to the internet, they open like because it was the only way they could keep the VPN for people with like really critical assets. And that's just changing. And Google was on the leading edge of that. Right, so just assume everybody's on the internet because it's Silicon Valley. Everyone's doing their work from a coffee shop anyway. Always happen, right? And you, you have to think about this kind of thing. Like, if you don't have something like an Earth Factory, and you don't have all your proxy and your endpoint controls to make sure you're using it, you know how easy it is for me to get around using your Earth Factory get on my desktop. Configuration. Yeah. So now what happens when I vendor something like this? Out? Oh, my pipeline's down. I'm just going to vendor it in so it'll pass. I'll fix it later. Famous last words, right? Okay. Hmm. Has this happened? Yes, absolutely. It happened in Python all the time for some reason. I can find you guys finally start to figure out like they got to be on top of it. But I mean, there's there's tons of security controls now that go into just operating a registry like this, trying to detect stuff like this because name confusion is a big problem, right? It's it's type it's domain typo squatting for packages, right? It's the same crap. Sometimes it's legitimate and just they want to redirect things so they can track something, you know, personal data, you know, things that are not great, but are, you know, like, you know, bring your whole system down or, you know, cause you to have to report a breach. But sometimes they're really bad, right? NPM, like another one, like they had to get their, they had to get their crap together, right? They, they didn't anticipate this at all. And they, like, they got blindsided and it was 
NPM was like unusable for months while they figured out how to get out of front of this, this massive influx of endless amount of packages. Just recently, PyPM actually had to close the doors for a while, like no new packages. There was such a big wave of it, they just had to shut the doors until they could figure out how to deal with it. Right? It's crazy. At least it was up so people could still, you know, buy stuff. But like everybody who, who deploys to the public via PyPI, doodles, <laughs> right? You couldn't update your stuff. Legitimate package subversion, right? It's same thing, right? You know, oh, uh, this is another reason to version it, by the way. Oh, I'm, just, I'm gonna I'm gonna pin to so the patch versions are automatic. Cool. What happens when the patch when the uh, patch version that just got released has a malicious change to it? How would you know? Whose job is it to know? Right. And this is this is one of those things you got to balance as an adopter of open source. Is I get the convenience. I want I want security fixes. I want bug fixes. But I also need to make sure that I'm getting bug fixes. That I have. I'm not gonna say no new bugs because we all know better. But like net better, right? <laughs> I've bettered things without making anything significantly worse. Whose job is that? Right? And you, you know, if you ask the security guy, most security guy, well, it's the developer's job. Right? Like, are, are you guys, do you, is this what you want to spend your day doing? Re reviewing all of your open source updates? <laughs> do you have better stuff to do? I'm a security guy, I got better stuff to do, right? Like, but like this, no, it's nobody's job in most organizations. Sometimes you'll have like a DevOps team who takes this on, right? Um, and I can go on a whole rant about how if you have a DevOps team, you're probably doing DevOps wrong. But um, like, there are there are DevOps teams that that take this on and go, hey, we're gonna you know periodically review stuff as it comes to artifactory, spot check it, randomly check it, something. Right? You can't do it all. It's not possible. But they'll spot check it. They'll do something. They'll put some tools in. They'll they'll do program analysis. Is actually useful here. You can look and go at things and go, okay. So here's a library that used to make a couple of like process forks. Okay. Starting OS processes, that's reasonable. Now it makes 200 of them. That seems fishy, right? So you can kind of look for some here, but you're never going to do this manually, right? You need tools to do this. Fortunately, there are some good open source tools. A little bit of a rabbit hole there. There are some good open source tools to help get out in front of this and look for like API counts, things like that. And you, you just got to have. Like every other risk we talked about, it's not like you got to freak out and not use open source. You just got to have a plan, right? How do we stay up in front of it? How do we balance the benefits with managing the risk, right? Has this happened? Yes, of course it has, right? These are also often called backdoors because media reports everything accurately, right? But it's, it's malicious code. My, my favorite is, is these kind of things, right? They didn't patch anything about the actual library. If you ship that to production, you'll be fine. However, your pipeline is hosed because the installer actually had a vulnerability. They would just let you execute arbitrary code as part of installing the dependency. Data JavaScript, right? I mean, to be honest, it's half of the Java too. Java can make system calls. <laughs> uh, Gradle is a very interesting plugin system, and you can get it to execute arbitrary code or have been certain versions that have since been yanked, fortunately. But like, it's a thing that happens, right? You're not just adopting the library, you're adopting the little bit, the little micro ecosystem around it. It's installer, it's use of VLS, it's resource management, all of that stuff, right? So how do we protect ourselves? Um, there's a lot, right? So it, a little bit, it's a focus thing, right? So this is kind of, there, there are some standards for this stuff, right? So there, there's the kind of stuff that we're trying to go on in terms of defensive controls for software quality, right? The interesting thing to me up here is the top three, right? Because software bill of materials. Now, a lot, a lot because of the executive order on software bill of materials, a lot of focus has been put on like being able to publish a good document that is your SBOM. But the reality is you just need to know what's in there, right? That's the important part. The document's evidence that you got there, right? If you don't know, and cannot easily find out everything that you're bringing into something that you're going to ship to production or ship to your customers. What are you doing? Right? You, you, you have to know the end. You have to be able to answer this question. Everything else on here requires you to do a good job of this. Right? Now, fortunately, Java is pretty good about that. Maven dependency tree is a beautiful tool. Right? If you're using Gradle, sorry. 
Um, but I mean, it's out there. There's lots of good open source tools. There's Cyclone DX generators, all kinds of things. If you just need a good bill of materials. Yeah, I just want to point out, it's not just what's in your Java application. It's in your container, oh. in your server, everything else. Yeah, there's, there's other bills of materials, right? It's not just your library set. You also have to look at like the whole supply chain question is like you have this main line of like, if you think of a pipeline as I push code in one end and I get deployable package out the other, right? Your supply chain also includes all of the tooling that makes it happen, right? So it's it's containers because that's part of what you're shipping, right? That's part of it too, OS vulnerabilities and things like that in your production environment. But it's also things like, okay, I'm pulling down because pipelines love to download things, right? I'm pulling down the latest patch version of OpenJDK 17 in order to build this every time my pipeline runs. Am I verifying that download? That it is what I expect it to be? If you're using an artifact where you can sign one, then be sure that that one's the one you're getting every time. What if you're not? Not everybody has it. Okay. How, how do you know that all your tooling is okay? Solar winds, <laughs> right? How could you have possibly defended? By the way, any company who tells you that they're selling a security, I'm probably in trouble with this if you're recorded, but like any company that tells you we can solve solar winds, you know they can't. That's marketing. They can solve maybe one possible aspect of it where they maybe would have detected that specific thing if it happens again because now we've seen it, but they're not going to stop the next one. Nobody knows how to do that. Everybody would love to figure it out. I'd love to figure it out. Nobody's figured it out yet. Right. So then patch management, right? How are you going to update your dependencies? Right. And again, like not not just libraries, everything. Right? What what is your strategy? In your versions? In your minor? How do you know when to update a minor? What signals are you putting in your environment? And they should be a pipeline, right? Where you work. What signals are you getting to tell you you need to update? How do you make that decision? How do you manage the exceptions to it? Right? What happens when you go, oh, it's time to update a minor again? And we did rudimentary checking. It seems fine. I updated and everything broke. This is not my highest priority right now. How, how do I turn it into plan to work? I can't just never do it. I've got to have a plan. Yeah. Are you finding anyone running like canary environments to do things like we're not going to develop with or push to production, you know, every single incremental patch version, but we're going to have an environment where we like have unpinned and we're keeping up and knowing when it breaks at least. Yeah, a lot, a lot of like uh, financial services are heavily regulated are doing things like that where They'll have like a live live testing in a constrained network, and they'll be pushing that out at least once a day, probably many times a day, right? And they'll have actual like for a long time people had that was just like a playground, but now they're like, hey, that's a great place to put like security tools and stuff like that to figure those things out. And the the problem is you, what you get is like okay that's unpinned, but now you're like manifest modifying in a pipeline. There's some resistance to that for, I think, pretty good reasons, right? And that's, you know, another thing like places, things like Artifactory come into play there, right? So you can have a, an Artifactory that lets you just be a proxy to everything, and then the production Artifactory has convergence, right? That's one way to do that. And I've seen that a lot. Um, I've seen people like routinely daily pen test against staging, right? So try to find some of this stuff, but like you still need a strategy. Like you need to sit down, you know, with your architecture board, your, you know, the developer. I hate that. I'm going to use a word I hate thought leaders. Right, the people who don't have any authority, but everyone listens to anyway. Right, probably a number of you in this room. Uh, you don't you have to figure out your strategy. How are you going to manage your patches? Like, what are you going to do about routine patching? What are you going to do about okay? There's a CVE. When do I decide if it's bad enough, and relevant enough that I need to do an out of band update? Right. I would do things like okay, is it actually <laughs> is there actually a real patch? Or are we just updating the update? Um, is it going to break everything? Great. Let's change it back. Um, are we using that vulnerable part? Like, have we done the program in like, hey, security team, have you done program analysis on this to determine if it actually affects me, or are we just updating it to make the thing go away? Because unless you're FedRAMP, you should never just update to make the thing go away. FedRAMP's going to make you, right? The government does what the government does. Right? And then, like, SCA, right? So those three things together, right? So they're kind of interrelated. You can't really do any one of those well without doing the other two, right? 
So like I'm a little biased because like you know I work for an SEA company. <laughs> but like you need to be able to know from your output. Like, I, I take the source code, the manifest files, and the compiled jar, I should be able to find out what's in there. And I, I mean exactly what's in there. I want to know exactly what version of Commons text I have. You would be surprised how many free SBOM generators get it wrong because they make bad guesses. Assuming there's not six different versions in which they have them. <laughs> there often are, right? And you get into that like dependency, uh, dependency call again, right? Reference by what? <laughs> you know? The other thing is all, all really important. I have issues with RASP. I don't think it's worth it. Um, again, you know, ask your security guys, you have five, five opinions, but RASP is the idea that you can like instrument your, your binary or have a runtime agent that's going to monitor for security issues. And of course, there's zero performance penalty doing this. And it works great. <laughs> but, you know, these are the things that there, there are things to be said earlier, with, right? Um, just, you know, those are vulnerability scanners. You have to see pipelines or stuff like that. Just things you can do. Like, I have this risk. I can't eliminate it. I don't need to, but I do need to mitigate it somewhat. Okay. I need to get out of my operational and security risk so that when I'm out, when I'm adopting open source, I'm doing it just the eyes open. Right. I'm making sensible decisions. Right. As you get further down, you get into things like code signing. Right. You can start to really kind of focus on some of these things. Right. So the ultimate kind of high maturity way to get out in front of this stuff and, and do these three things really, really well is to be able to go, I know what went into the pipeline. I know what came out of the pipeline. I know that what came out of the pipeline is a result of what came into the pipeline is what I expected. And I can go look at production and I can go, yes, that thing that's in production is what I built here. To do that, you need reproducible builds and you need code signing, right? Build dependencies from source. Which can, it is a defense, right? It, it, it bypasses, you could bypass, you know, Maven Central and things like that, and, you know, build projects yourself. You have to you disagree with this organization. Yes. No, your tool chain is secure. And also, and not compromised. Super expensive, right? Especially if you're doing cloud pipeline stuff, right? You're, you're now you're running a ton of pipelines and you're paying per minute, right? It is a defense, it's valid to be on the defense list. Not something I would recommend, right? But reproducibility builds integrity checking and code signing. That's kind of like gold standard, right? If you can get there in your environment where you know, hey, I understand what I put in, and I have confidence that what I see in production was a result of that, and I can prove it because I can do it again, right? That attestation, that like code to code, people are calling it code to cloud. Nobody's figured that out yet either, by the way. <laughs> it's starting to be marketed because people understand that that's ultimately the solution we need, but nobody's got like a turnkey code to cloud. Right? You're going to have to build pieces of it yourself. Um, hybrid attack again, right? Uh, a lot of the stuff we talked about with you know using Artifactory instead of just using Maven Central helps with that a lot because if it's not in your Artifactory, you'll be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? That's a huge like to me that that's typo guard done the right way. Is I have my list of what I expect to see. And if you try to install something, it's gonna get it's gonna all kinds of bells and whistles going off. The trick to doing this well though is to make sure that you're doing it in a way that's somewhat sustainable. Because if you have some teams getting and you're like, I want to use a new library and it goes, well no, and it's gonna be five days before you're allowed to build this, that sucks for everybody. <laughs> right. So like if you want to do this, you need to figure out how to do like automatic admission. For stuff like you know, like how, how do I assess this thing and go, hey, I'm gonna have a piece of software that goes and checks Maven Central for it and goes, you know, how long has it been in existence? How long has this version been released? Can I query the NV here and see if there's critical issues? Can I? We we have a open SSF exists. We have our own version of it, right? Where you can kind of like do a score or query on an API and be like, hey, is this well maintained? Is it popular? Is it? And if it's like, if it seems kind of sketched, then you then you have human review, right? The stuff that's so you do that way, like well established stuff, you don't have to wait six months for somebody to say that, right? Um, preventative squatting is fun. Just register your own packages, <laughs> have them be automatic mirrored with the real thing. A few big projects do that, and then like get rid of stuff you're not using. You would be absolutely, well, you wouldn't be absolutely stunned. I was stunned to realize how many times dev teams will just completely stop relying on something and it's still on the manifest forever. You know how many times I like I had to do the incident response for Logger Shell? 
Do you know how many times we found it in a manifest and it hadn't actually been used for years? Think about how, like, think about the bandwidth that was consumed to download that thing every time, and think about the file size. Like, like wars aren't small anyway, but like, I'm shipping Log4J on every single one of 1,700 machines, and nobody's using it. <laughs> it's insane, right? So, like, from an ops standpoint, this is a really good idea, but it also keeps things from people accidentally hooking old vulnerable versions because it's in there. I should use it. Any thoughts about this? Anything seem insane to anybody? Anything seem like missing? The preventative squatting is interesting. I, I, is that when somebody found a malicious package in the public repositories, what was the knee-jerk reaction? Just to delete it or to lock down that name so it couldn't be used again by somebody else? So the repo is actually lock it now, right? At, at first, it was like, we'll just delete it and just get you know, recreated by right. some other email address or whatever. Uh, what's interesting to see this year is this is largely like maintainers of open source stuff, right? So Google started to do this quite a bit when they released something out for like their I mean, their ML stuff. They use the same generators that people use to like, you know, deal with typo squatting for domain names, right? Show me common typos that people are likely to make. I'm going to place this same package or it's going to be a package that like will fail all the tests. Like it's a dummy package. It's like, no, you actually want to you have a typo, yo. And it's it's actually kind of nice because like from a developer standpoint, this is kind of a nice service. I love when like a couple times I've gotten hit by it where like I just, I put it wrong in the manifest, and then you know I get I run the test, and like it makes a call to the entry point, and the entry point gives me a console error, and says, hey, no, dummy, you meant to send it. And he was like, oh, hey, thanks, appreciate it. So, but that typo, don't you think that the Maven second pass test should uh, be very um, to see in filtering the things they've uploaded, right? Yeah, it's a hard problem. Uh, and then they are like the repos are getting a lot better about it, uh, about type of squatting and things like that, and, and doing scans and you know doing things like telling you on the Maven Central page like, hey, this is a new thing, or you know uh, like npm started to do uh, if you do npm install something, it looks like it might be a typo. It goes, hey, like this is a really new package. Are you sure you didn't mean this other one? Because the catch is like, what if I have a legitimate package that just has a very similar name or references it in some way, right? So it, it's a really hard problem because you also don't want to just like kick everything out there. Right. I have had this name now, no one can name it so anything similar ever again, right? So yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting defensive strategy and defensive position to have to take, right? And you know some of this some of this is not on you. Some of this is like when you're evaluating uh, a big package, a major package, you can use a lot of places like. Make sure they're doing some of this stuff, right? So, you know, things like this, like metrics, you know, open SSF, or, you know, if you have an SCA tool, they should be providing you scorecard data, right, of some kind that lets you build policy around, you know, what your metrics are, right? What are the things that you care about that you think are risky should be highlighting to those as you adopt things, right? Um, you know, help yourself do a little research. There's another squatting example I don't think is covered by any of those. Hopefully the tools have fixed it now, but. They were going out to the internet first, downloading those, and so people would squat on a name that they thought another company might use. Yeah. There's also like source confusion, which is related. Um, it's one of my favorites just because I think it's really clever. And it's this idea that like when I do you know Maven install, right? There's an order to my repositories. As a developer, I'm kind of assuming an order goes in a certain way, but I might be wrong. And so if I can compromise something higher in the list than what you expected to do, or if I can get you to add a source, which is one of the things, like one of the pieces of mouse that people would, would slip in, in NPM, especially with the kind of uncontrolled installer stuff, is it would just add sources. And now every package you download is malicious because like I control the repository. So kind of a similar thing of like, you know, hey, you're expecting it to come from your internal source. But I registered that same package on the internet, and you did the internet first, and now I control it. You're gonna have to rename it and redo all your branding. Yeah, right. malicious repository doesn't know what you're using in your project until you go get it. So yeah. there's also just like behavioral stuff. Like how many times have you seen in the news where somebody just, you know, some maintainer takes their toys and goes home? They don't just abandon the project; they nuke it. Right? Hey, I uploaded. I uploaded a version that does not work. Codehouse.org. Yeah. <laughs> I uploaded a version that does not work and I deleted the GitHub. So now, like, 
all of your pipelines are now broken. Like, yeah, you can go find that archive somewhere, but like now you have work to do, yeah. right? So this stuff is why um, this was a, I'm gonna say GIF or GIF, I'm gonna say GWIF. This was a GWIF, but I like PDS, so. Um, and but yeah, this is, the, the job requirements list is again, the end of the scroll, right? A lot of people put a lot of this stuff on, on their security teams and say, oh, this is a security problem, right? Vulnerabilities in my in my packages are a security problem. It can't be, right? We're, we're not any better staff than you guys are. Like I get it, everybody has too much to do. Everybody, your AppSec team not only has too much to do, they probably don't have the skill set. The, the reality is like when AppSec started, it was people who'd been developers, right? I'm like, hey, like I just care about the security thing. But now a lot of times it's either people who are increasingly have gone to school for AppSec, which is okay, but they may not have ever like participated in a real development team. Probably written some code in a degree program, but like they never worked on a dev team. They don't really get it, right? They're trying their best. But it's also a lot of like, oh, hey, so-and-so, you're a great network engineer. Great network security person. We need an asset team. It's your job now. I've had way too many friends that's happening to, right? And it sucks for them, and they're just trying to do the best. And so they they buy tools and they go, "Dev team, your problem, right?" And you guys are like, "Would you please stop giving me all this crap, right?" It, it, it's this cycle, right? So your 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 upset team needs better tools for one, uh, but also like, so you know, for the better tool standpoint, reach out to your asset teams. Like, make sure that somebody who knows what they're doing from a developer standpoint, who understands how people actually do day-to-day -day development, how your pipelines work, is involved in the purchasing decisions for AppSec tools. Because otherwise, you're just going to get very expensive things that don't help you. They're just going to make more work for you and have arguable benefit, right? Uh, the other thing is, if you don't have a security champion program, I'll build one. The idea is to have people on your team who have some additional, uh, like, security and kind of safety, operational safety type training, right? For this management training. They're developers. They're shipping software every day alongside you. You probably already work with them. You're not hiring for this role. You're just giving them a little bit of training, a little bit of access so that they become like, kind of like how SRE happened, right? When we went to school to be an SRE, they, they're developers and they're like, I really like this reliability stuff, right? There are developers in your organization who really like this security <laughs> stuff. Give them jobs, right? Work with your AppSec team. Get them to do some of that stuff because just, you can't hire the person who understands all of this stuff. They don't exist. Well, and then I think I'd say it's because I did this turn a developer into an AppSec person and never get to touch software again. Yeah. And it sucks. There's this whole cycle thing that, that happens. And I, I like to hit this a little bit because I've done all of those jobs. Right, so I'm not I'm not the world's best software developer. I'm not the world's best security guy, but I'm okay in a lot of things, right? And like, what I really like to see, like, AppSec is the one security discipline where we're not allowed to fix what we find. And like, most AppSec teams probably shouldn't be. I'm not saying there's a problem that you know with the, with a particular policy, but like, I think organizations need to figure out how to make that not true, right? You need your AppSec team to have the competence and the knowledge and the experience to be able to contribute a PR. There's lots of things that they can fix without screwing everything up, right? There's some things you're gonna need your help for, and some things are complicated. Some vulnerabilities require you to rethink how you've engineered a, a, an application, right? And if they don't know your app intimately, they're not gonna be able to help much. But stuff like, can they open a branch, update a dependency, and let the test suite run and see if it breaks? And if it doesn't go, hey, Here's my PR for the update, which please accept it and fix the security flaw. And a lot of organizations, we don't let AppSec people do that. And it, it leads to this cycle where like the AppSec people don't have the skill in a lot of cases. We don't teach it to them. When you get an AppSec person who has been a developer and has the skill, they get frustrated because they're not allowed to help. And then like they go, well, why should I bother to have the skill? Because I'm never going to be allowed to do a PR anyway. So what's the point? And it becomes this vicious circle where nothing gets better and everyone's just mad at each other all the time when like the SecOps is the way, man. We all have shared responsibility for shipping good stuff. Right? And AppSec needs to learn more about the shipping part. And Dev in general needs to learn a little bit more about the securing part. Right? Because you need to you need to know enough to be dangerous and when when to get help. Any thoughts, questions? 
what is the number that you had like SG something, SG1, SG2, what does it mean? So there's software guidelines. So they're um, trying to remember the name of the program that does this. I think it's a MITRE branch. Um, it's been a little while since I don't, don't these movies, but they're, they're like the, the software guideline assessment stuff from, I want to say it's MITRE, but I'm having a brain moment. It's, it's some software quality, software assurance organization. Looks pretty sure it's might look a bit like the CWD stuff. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit like that. Yeah, it's another taxonomy. If you email me, I have a list that um, with a repository from SAP that has that as well as um, three other sources of similar types of things that are all related so that you can do a um, risk is for, for software security chains. So Thanks. I can get you that info. Sure. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Are you going to be at the OWASP? I am. Thursday. Yeah. Okay, this, this is my little bitch for, uh, you know, cross-population. Since OWASP is no longer the open web app security project, uh, I can't remember the new name, but they're like, yeah, it's not World. just about World, that's right. But World application is very wrong. Clever of them to keep the acronym. Um, good, it's a good organization, right? Um, and they, they always need... OWASP started as a way for developers to talk, have meaningful conversations about securing web apps, right? And it kind of got co-opted by the security industry a little bit. And I think Dev is trying to start to take it back a little bit, which I think is a good thing. I think both of those audiences, it's a great spot for people to get together and talk about these things because like, you can't be a developer now and not care about security. Those days are done. And, and my experience is for the past 20 years, I haven't met a developer that will just say, like, I don't care. It's just, you know, you got 15 other things to care about too. But you do, like, this changes so fast compared to everything else you got to be on top of, right? So unless you're doing like cloud engineering stuff, like deep cloud engineering stuff, that also changes crazy fast. But like security, like you have to figure out a way to stay up on top of the stuff that matters. OS does a really good job of like, you don't have to know everything, but this stuff matters. Imperfect, but. Also, you provide free stuff. educational materials yep. that you can use internally, free libraries and tools. Yeah, a lot, a lot of great free tools. Um, I know Zap kind of stopped being a, you know, OWASP project now, but that was born. There's like a free burp suite kind of called the, the Z attack proxy, uh, that for short. And great little Java app, right? You fire it up, you point your browser at it, and you can tamper with your requests to your heart's content and get full logs of all the request responses for an interaction you have in your browser. We do SSL interception for you. Really, really great for debugging maddening like HTTPS issues. Right? Why is this like this? I'll just see it directly. Like that thing and Postman like together is a lot of my life right now.